So we've already talked a little bit about these um, kind of general principles of version control. Um, in this video, what I want to do is get a lot more hands-on and look at an actual tool, which is uh, Git. Um, so there's lots of different version control, uh, uh, control system tools out there. Um, there's some open source ones like SVN, Git, Mercurial. Uh, Microsoft has one called Team Foundation. And, um, and by far the most popular one is Git, which is why I want to use it in this course. Now, there's nothing stopping you from installing Git on your computer and uh, kind of creating repositories with, um, with your code in them and start using that. But what a lot of people often want to do is to have the repositories also online, um, both in terms of like, well, if my laptop dies, I don't want to lose my code and I want to make it easy for other people to see my code. And so all of these different uh, providers have emerged that provide, you know, often some free and then paid tier of Git hosting, and, and some of the big ones are GitLab, Bitbucket, and uh, GitHub, which not too long ago Microsoft actually bought. Um, and so we're using GitHub because that's kind of like the dominant uh, uh, Git provider um, as well. And so what I'll encourage you all to do is to go to GitHub and sign up for a free account, um, you know, either during the next lab or, or now if you like. And um, when you do that, you have to choose a name. And, and so one advice I'll give is choose a name that won't embarrass you. Um, it's not uncommon to uh, put a link to your GitHub account on, on say, a resume, right? So, um, you know, I appreciate humorous names, but just think about, you know, if you're uh, somebody interviewing, you will appreciate it. And then the other thing is, is well, you can create sometimes private repositories on GitHub, um, but by default, they're going to be public. And so uh, be careful. Uh, don't, when I'm teaching you how to use Git in this class, don't use it to post um, you know, project work um, that other people could use because we reuse projects across semesters. So I want to keep that private. So a little bit of a backstory on where Git came from. Um, it was actually written by this guy, Linus Torvalds. Um, Linus is actually from his name. We got Linux, but he was the developer um, for the Linux open source operating system we're going to be using this semester. And as you can imagine, you know, an operating system is a huge software project. Lots of people involve lots of code. And so absolutely something you would want in version control. And so everybody was kind of wondering, well, where, what version control will we use? Um, hopefully some sort of open source one, maybe like SVN or something. And, um, and Linus, he's kind of this cranky person. Um, actually, when I was searching for a photo to put on here, the first photo I saw was of him giving the camera uh, the middle finger. And so he kind of decided to everybody's dismay, well, I'm gonna put in a closed source system um, you know, he said that he liked open source stuff, like open source operating systems, but, you know, he decided to put Linux source code, this most famous open source project, on uh, BitKeeper for version control, um, which was uh, closed source, and he thought the best at the time. And uh, anyway, it kind of blew up in his face because uh, BitKeeper eventually, for political reasons, stopped letting certain um, Linux developers use it. But he was kind of in this tricky place now where he made this decision that everybody disliked and then it turned bad. And so um, to fix it, he uh, built a new version control system uh, from scratch and that was Git and that, that is where Linux now um, lives, of course. And so famous guy for both you know Linux and, and now also Git, very successful projects. So I'm going to be pretty hands-on here and um, doing some things pretty related to what you're going to be doing for project one. Um, for project one, I have created this kind of play uh, repo that we're going to be using. And, and I'm actually just going to go and, and look at that on GitHub right now. So I'm going to just open this link. And um, I'm not going to be spending a lot of time on the slides. That's more for your um, kind of reference. So I'm going to come here um, to GitHub. And if you look in these URLs, there will usually be two parts to them. The first part um, is a username. So my GitHub username is just Tyler Harder. And then I might have multiple repositories uh, that are public on here. And this one is just CS320-P1. And so in this repository, I can see the code. And there's this one file, uh, wc.py. That stands for word count, um, dot pi, and, and there's some code there. And, and if I hit back, um, I can see, well, there's no releases. There's no tags. Um, I can look at these commits if I want. So I'm going to head over here to the commits. And, um, and I see that there's these three developers, right? I have Steve, 
um, Linus, Ada. We're all kind of doing um, these different changes, right? And if I want, I can click on on one of these and see well what what change was made. So in this one, I can see that on the left, I see the old version. So I see that instead of this line of code, it got a change to these um, lines of code. Uh, if I go back to the very first one, which I guess is this one, then I see nothing on the left-hand side because this was a brand new file, right? So I only see the new file on the right-hand side. So I can kind of go back and see all of these changes um, over time. Okay, so I want to get this code on to my computer, or specifically the Linux virtual machine that you set up in lab. So I'm going to head over to my um, my terminal, and here I'm going to say uh, I have the command handy. You know what? This is actually a good trick. If I hit Control R and I start typing, say like SSH, it'll take me back to the last command uh, where I ran that. So this is going to let me connect to my virtual machine. So I'm going to do SSH. Um, this is the IP address of that machine. And then this is my username on that. So I'm going to connect like that. And, and now let me actually just type clear here. So it's kind of clean. Remember, anything I'm typing here right now is not running on my laptop. It's running on that lurch, a virtual machine um, in Google's cloud. And, and it just so happens that based on the directions we gave, a get is already installed here. So I can just run get like that, and I get maybe more uh, directions than I'd like, right? I get this usage line, get all these things in brackets are optional, right? So I can run all those things, and there's all these different commands. And so maybe I'll do that first. I'll say get dash dash version and see what that gives me. So I'll say get dash dash version, and I can see I'm on version 2.17.1. Uh, and that's a little important to note sometimes. I mean, Git is evolving over time. So if you're looking for tutorials, you might want to make sure you're on the right the right version. But hopefully most of the stuff I'm showing hasn't isn't kind of changing a lot currently. Um, so if I say ls, um, here I am. I'm in, let me run pwd. I'm in my home directory. I have a bunch of stuff here. And, um, and I want to get this code from GitHub uh, onto my virtual machine. And so the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to head back here and, and go back to the project. And you see there's this button here that says get the code. And and here you can see that this ends uh, uh, in uh, .get and it's saying run with SSH. I actually don't want that one. Make sure that I'm using HTTPS. So I can do that. I can see it starts with HTTPS. Actually it still ends with get. And um, I want to copy that. I can actually click this button or copy it like normal. And I can use this to pull down the code uh, to my computer. So, so let me do that. I'm going to say uh, get clone. So clone is like a download of the code. And I'm going to paste you know, this thing that I copied. I'm going to copy that and paste that over here. And, and basically it downloaded it. And it created a directory called cs320-p1 after I ran this git clone command. And so I'm going to cd to that. I'm going to cd to the 320-p1 directory. I'm going to say ls. And uh, sure enough, here I see that same wordcount.py file that, that we saw on the, on the website. And, and so maybe actually let me just try running that thing. I'm going to say python3 wordcount.py. And I get this nice usage line. So Python 3 word count dot pi. You, you see now, this is just kind of a convention, right? When I have these kinds of brackets, I mean, it means I actually need something here. Um, this means like an or. So I, I see that I can say something like word count dot three word count dot pi. And then I have to like put a file name here. And then I can say either all or a specific word. All right, so let me back this up. I, I have to get some sort of file here to run this on. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to say echo. A, 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 B, C, C, and, uh, well, remember if I do echo, that just goes straight to the screen. Or I can put it in a file, and I'm going to put that in a file called example.txt. And now if I use cat to look inside of example.txt, I see that I get the same stuff that I echoed into that file. Okay, so now I'm going to run this thing, python wordcount.py example.txt all python3 wordcount.py 
example.txt, and then all. And I can kind of see what this program is, is doing, right? It uh, is taking in a file and counting the words in it. I mean, a word is something with a space between it and giving me back a dictionary to show me how often each word occurs. So I guess I get three A's, um, you know, one B and, uh, and two C's, right? So that's the program. And, um, and you're gonna be using this for your, for your project, right? You're gonna be analyzing uh, different versions of this program. Okay, so that's the current version. Um, let, let me try doing this. I wanna actually see, um, I kind of want to see like the different versions. And so if I say ls, I just see that there's these two things here. Let me show you another version of ls. If I say ls dash a, that's saying show me all the files. And so when I do that, I get these things too. And I also get some other stuff. So it turns out on Linux, anything that starts with a period is a hidden file, right? So I don't get to see those hidden files unless I say um, dash a. So, so what are these three things? Um, dot is a little silly. That just means that's the current directory I'm in. Dot dot means um, one directory up. And then I have this dot get. And it turns out that this dot get directory contains all the information about all the previous versions of, of this code. And so it's kind of nice, right? When I'm working here, I'm just acting like I'm working with regular files. And, um, and then there's other versions kind of hidden here that I can um, access if I run various tools, but I don't have to think about it all the time. I can just work with my files um, like I normally would. So, you know, what is not very uh, convenient would be to look in there directly. Instead, I'm going to run my git commands. And so one git command that you're going to use a lot is called git log. And what git log does is it shows me a history um, of all the commits. And so I can use the arrow keys to go up and down and these are the same commits um, that we saw on the website. And let me just look at what, what's going on here. There's four pieces of information. One is that I can see a message uh, for each commit. And maybe let me just go back here too. And um, I can see like this, this one, right? Only make one pass over list to count all. I have the exact same thing here. Only make one pass over list to commit all. Um, what else do I have here? I have um, the date. I think that's self-explanatory. Um, who did it and their email address. And then finally, I have up here a commit number. And it's kind of a funny looking number, right? It's not a nice number like one, two, three, four. And, and you can see it's, it's what's funny about it is it actually has letters in it. And that's because it's what we call a hexadecimal number. And, and you're familiar with decimal numbers. Uh, decimal numbers have digits zero, one, two, um, all the way up to nine, right? There's 10 digits in the decimal system. In a hexadecimal system, there's actually 16 different digits. And, and so what that means is that, well, we have zero, one, two, three, all the way up to nine, but then 10, instead of having a one zero for 10, we have just a single character that represents 10. And that character is A. And, um, and we have a single character which represents 11 and that's B. And then, you know, C is 12 and, and all the way up to F. And that's why you're going to see the letters A through F in this number in addition to uh, regular digits that we're familiar with. So don't overthink it, right? It's just a number. It just looks a little weird. Um, it's a hexadecimal number, um, but it doesn't hurt us. Okay, so that's all the information there. And I can uh, scroll down. Now, now, let's say I wanted to go back and see see an earlier version of the code. Like, let's say I wanted to see this version. What I can do is I can copy that, like so, to my clipboard. And, and I somehow have to get out of this now. And the way I'm going to escape out of this is I'm going to hit the Q on the keyboard. Q is for quit. So I type Q, and I'm back to normal now. Okay? And so what I can do is I can say get checkout, and then I paste this thing, right, that I just copied. I'm going to paste this down here. And... This is going to take me to that version. Don't mix this up. The other command we used earlier to download everything was clone. The so clone kind of pulled everything down. Checkout is taking me to a specific version. So I'm going to run that. And I get a lot of information here. Um, I'm in detached head state. Uh, we'll learn what that is. It's not as gruesome as it sounds. And I can say ls. And, and I still have this file here. Now, if I go back and I run that program again, like I did before, you see that I'm getting different output before. 
because when I went back to an earlier version, well, this program is different, right? And it behaves a little bit differently. Um, that's to be expected. Okay, now let's say I want to go back to that latest version. I can kind of switch to any version I want. Actually, one more thing. Let me run git log here. This is confusing to people. Hey, this is the one I had checked out, right? 60 something, right? That's the one I had checked out. Notice that when I run git log, it shows me the one I'm currently on and everything before that. And since this is the first one, there is nothing before that, right? So that can be a little confusing. But if I if I want to get back to kind of the latest history, right, I can scroll all the way up here, um, I know that I can do git checkout and uh, this thing, okay? Now, it, it turns out that that there are actually um, some shortcuts for that. And, and one of them is I can say uh, master. Master right now is another name for this commit number, right? So I could say get check out and paste that thing, get back to the latest. Actually, I think I didn't copy it. That was the wrong one. But I, I could paste that, or I can just say get check out master. And now if I say get log again, I have that same history I had be, before, right? And the master is kind of the end. Um, and, and like I've said, uh, you know, that's going to eventually be renamed uh, main, which I think is a, a more appropriate um, name. Okay, so, so here I am. I'm at the most recent history again. And, and let's say I want to make some changes, right? I want to write some new history. Um, how can I do that, right? How can I edit this file? Well, it turns out that since we're in an SSH session, um, I can't open up something like idle or any sort of program that has a graphical user interface. I need to use what is, is basically called like a terminal um, editor, right? I have to do everything inside of this terminal window. And, um, and it turns out, well, there's a few of them. Um, one that I use, uh, you know, all the time personally is Emacs. I could, if I wanted to say, uh, Emacs word count dot pi, and that would bring up um, the file and I could edit it in here. Um, I'm not gonna recommend that because it kind of has a steep learning curve. Um, other ones that people are use are word vim. I do vim word count out pi. Also a steep learning curve. Uh, for this class, we're gonna use nano. Nano is kind of easy to pick up for now. So I'm gonna say nano word count dot pi and I can see, well, here's the file and, and I can edit it. I can just kind of use the, the keyboard move around. If I use the mouse, that does nothing, right? I'm kind of clicking down here. Um, I only can use the keyboard to get around the arrow keys. Okay, so this is the program. And, um, and let me just make a make some sort of change. Um, like maybe, oh, I'm going to print hello here just to show that I'm making some sort of change. And, um, and I want to save this file. And um, what I like about Nano is that all of these things down here at the bottom are shortcuts. And, um, and it turns out that the way the shortcuts work is that the little hat symbol means the control on, on my keyboard, right? So when I wanna save this file, I wanna write it out. So I'm gonna say control, control O. And, and then it asks me, well, what I wanna save it as? The same thing, word count dot pi. So I'm gonna hit enter. And, um, and it saved it. Okay, so how do I get out of here? Um, I can do control X to exit. So control X and I'm out of here. And now if I actually run, run word count.py again, Python 3 word count.py, I can see that I actually made my change and everything is good. Okay, now if I run let me, I'm going to teach you a new command here. I'm going to run get status. What I see is that it recognizes that I modified this file, okay? But it's not really quite ready to be committed yet, right? It's not part of the history. And, um, and so what I really want to do is I want to say, hey, the file is a good version of it. I want to lock it in, into my history. And so the first step I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to have this git add and then a file name. And so I'm gonna do that git add and then word count dot pi. Let me run git status again. And now I can see, hey, this one is ready to be 
committed. And the reason why I have to specifically add certain files is that there are other files that I don't want to be part of this, right? Um, for example, on tracked files, example.txt, I was just playing around with that. I don't want that to be a part of the official history for this project, right? So after I've done that, I can run another command, which is git commit. And, um, and so after I've added, I have to do that. And notice that I'm adding this file, even though it was already part of the project. Whenever I change something, I have to add it again. So just get used to that. I'm going to do git commit. And then uh, what do I want to do here? Well, I'm going to say git commit and then dash m for message. And I can put a string here. And, um, and I'm going to say my new changes, right? So I'm going to commit my new changes just like so. And I run into a problem. It says, please tell me who you are, right? This is my first time using it. And so I need to make sure that um, I have both my email address and my name as part of the project. And they're giving me these nice commands to run. I'm going to copy and paste this thing. And let me back off. That's not my email address. I'm going to fix that. Or at wis.edu. And then I have to run this other thing. Right like that. I'm going to say Tyler. Fine for now. And then if I go up again, I can actually run. Well, where was it? Here it was. I'm just using the up and down arrow to see previously what I had. I'm going to run this again. Get commit. And then a message. And then my changes. So I'm going to do that. And it worked. And, um, and so now if I say get status, you know, there's nothing really changed, right? I mean, I'm not tracking that still, but there's no changes. And if I say get log, what I see at the top is that the most recent commit uh, was what I did today, right? Here are my new changes. And I can see the other ones as well. Okay. So let me, let me head back here briefly to what I want to talk about now before I wrap up are these kind of horrible um, commit numbers. Those are hard to keep track of. And so we want more convenient names for them. We've already seen one, right? We see that the master uh, refers to this most recent one. It's kind of a shortcut name for it. And so let me just head down here. Right, where I have like kind of all these um, commits and each commit is kind of based off another one. And we can give them names or labels. And there's two kinds of names. Uh, there's tags and there's branches. And, and there's always this default a branch called master, and that refers to most recent work. Um, I can, for example, here I have an intern branch, maybe that's for a subproject or an experimental branch. Um, so I can add these labels manually to these, or I can also create tags. Tags are also a manual label. And the difference is, you saw that with master, when I did a commit, it moved to my new commit. So as I keep committing, branches move along with me, whereas tags um, are permanently stuck to the same commit number. So what I'll do is I'll use tags for releases, right? Because that's a long-term thing. And I'll use branches to kind of keep track of where I'm currently working. And overall, I'm rarely going to be actually using um, specific commit numbers. I'm going to be using these labels instead. So we're going to pick up more next week um, with some more uh, examples of merging. I'll, I'll break off here.